Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Denise Kobuzda at University College Cork in Ireland. Delighted to welcome you on behalf of the organizing committee to the fourth in a series of seminars focusing on high resolution radio astronomy, the sharpest view of the radio universe, the LBI connecting astronomers worldwide. We're planning for several more seminars in the period up to the time of the next European VLBI Network Symposium, which we hope might be held in person on July 12th to 16th, 2021 in Cork, Ireland. That of course being subject to COVID rest restrictions. I'd like first to mention a few logistics of the webinar. You will be muted throughout the presentation but you are invited to type in any questions you may have for our speaker through the question and answer facility. You can send in questions both during and after the presentation, but questions will be answered only after the presentation. Please try to write your questions clearly and keep them short. We'll aim to get to as many of your questions as we can, and we apologize in advance if your question is not among those that we have time to answer. I would now like to invite Anna Bartkevich to introduce today's speaker, Mareki Honma, from the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Mareki Honma-san from Mizusawa VLBI Observatory, the part of the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. Uh, let's note that today we have the longest baseline between the organizing committee and the lecturer between Europe and Japan. Professor Honma-san is working on VERA. He's strongly involved in the major, cosmic maser astrophysics, astrophysics to reveal the 3D structure of our Milky Way. Moreover, he is also involved in the submillimeter and millimeter VLBI concerning the Im imaging of the supermassive black hole, the Event Horizon Telescope. So I hope we'll all enjoy the talk about the amazing world of masers. Okay, can I start? Okay, thank you very much, Anya, for a nice introduction. And also I would like to thank all the people here uh, for giving me this op opportunity to talk about our work and uh, also uh, exciting science uh, related to VLB astrometry. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, let's see. So I hope you are, you see my screen. And now it's in presentation mode. 
Uh, looks okay. Okay, so let me start. Uh, so again, my name is Mariki Homma from Mitsa VLB Observatory. That's uh, one branch of NLJ. So Mitsa is a kind of center uh, of VLB activity in Japan. And uh, currently I'm serving as a director of this uh, small observatory. So um, I'm uh, you know, uh, kind of busy for management job and uh, I, I, I'm a, have a slight problem, you know, having a little time for real science. But anyway, uh, let me try to, to do a, a presentation about galactic major source. But actually, let me start with uh, uh, introduction of our uh, observatory. So here is a map of Japan and the mid is located here. It's about uh, 400 kilometers north of Tokyo. And uh, they are uh, all the facilities which we are contributing somehow. Of course, this one is Vera. Uh, this is our main array consisting of four 20 meter diameter telescope and making VLBI within Japan. That's uh, dedicated to MESA astrometry, which I'm gonna talk about. Uh, but uh, I also, we are also uh, promoting international collaborations. Uh, this one is Kava. It's a combined array between KVN and Vera. So uh, there is a, KVN array having three stations in Korea and uh, combining with four stations there, we have a seven station array, which is operational like uh, every week. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of, you know, regularly operating facility. And we also have the EABN, East Asian VLB network, which consists of China and Korea and Japan. It's also operational and uh, regularly we have a uh, session of EABN and it's also open to international community. So if you are interested in using it, of course, you, you are welcome to submit proposal. And uh, compared to Vera and KVN, EABN have, uh, you know, has a baseline doubled and also it contains uh, big uh, dishes in China, like uh, 65 meters in Shanghai and so on. And we are also expecting to have new telescope, which is under construction in Thailand, uh, TNRT 40 meter telescope, hopefully coming next year. So we are extending more and more. And uh, as Anya introduced, we are also partner of EHT. Uh, <clears throat> of course, everybody, everybody knows about uh, M87 picture taken by EHT. You know, it's just hanging behind me, but today I'm, I'm going to skip this this is uh, this topic, but I'm focusing on VLB astrometry. So let me introduce about uh, VLB arrays for uh, astrometry, you know, actively working uh, uh, for VLB astrometry. And of course uh, we have EVN, that's a very nice array and uh, doing very good work related to astrometry. And also VLBA, <clears throat> that's a US array. And uh, there is an ongoing program called BESEL uh, dedicated to uh, maze astrometry and uh, galactic structure study, led by Mark Reed at CFA and also Carl Menten at uh, MPI Bonn. And uh, here we have Vera, and, uh, as I mentioned before. And also, if you go to Southern Hemisphere, of course, uh, there is LBA, that's Australian VLBLA, which is also very much productive in, in terms of maze astrometry. And uh, of course, uh, EAVN is not, not yet ready for doing astrometry, but uh, we are doing uh, sort of verification and evaluation of its performance. So hopefully quite soon, EAVN is also ready for doing astrometry. So here's a very basic uh, introduction of, uh, you know, on how we do astrometry using VLBI. Well, this is just a, uh, slide for non-expert or non-VLBI people. Uh, sorry, if you are familiar with VLBI, but here is a very, uh, you know, kind of schematic picture showing the VLBI uh, array consisting of only two stations. Here we have station one and station two observing at the target source. And then what we measure in VLBI observation is kind of delay you know, the electromagnetic wave is propagating at the speed of light. And then geometric location 
of these two stations causes the propagation delay, which is called geometric delay. And of course, it's related to the source direction and also baseline vector. So geometric delay is simply given by equation like this. But of course, it usually suffers from observational error. And uh, usually we have uh, <clears throat> major contribution uh, to error, uh, have, you know, uh, major contribution from tropospheric, tropospheric delay uncertainty, which is an order of one centimeter. If you, you know, uh, describe it in a path length. And then if you have a baseline of a couple of thousand kilometers for VODI, then expected absolute position error is something like delta L divided by baseline length which provides sub milli arc second scale. So this absolute measurement accuracy is not really high enough to do galactic scale astrometry because it requires kind of tens of micro arc second. But if you do kind of relative measurement, I mean, having two sources, one is target and uh, the other is reference. And uh, if you alternate positioning of these stations uh, very quickly, or maybe doing at the same time using dual beam system Vera. And then you can cancel out the tropos troposphere term, which is quite common to both these two sources. And then for astrometric accuracy, you can have uh, additional reduction factor of theta separation, which is the separation angle between these two sources. And if you have a separation of one degree, for example, between the reference and, and target, then you can get down uh, like a 10 micro arc second scale, which is really kind of target number for galactic scale astrometry. So this is the basic idea of what we are doing in relative astrometry. And uh, if you're interested in uh, technical part and also kind of review, then maybe you can take a look at the review, uh, which is written by Mark Reed and myself in annual review uh, published in 2014. And also we have a, now we have a new and very nice review uh, paper uh, written by Maria Rioja and Richard Dodson uh, published this year. So maybe you can take a look at this. So let me uh, just show an example of maze astrometry. This is a uh, uh, better result for Orion KL. So this is very famous nebula, uh, Ryan nebula with uh, trapezium here. And uh, well, actually this, this photo is taken by Subaru telescope. And uh, on the top right, you have an infrared source called KL, which is also associated with water maser, very strong water maser. And uh, Hirot-san did a very nice astrometric measurement of this water maser against quasar, of course. And this plot shows the east-west motion versus time over a period of more than two years. And you clearly see this kind of modulation, which is certainly from parallax. I mean, it's reflection of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And then by measuring this amplitude, of course, you can determine the parallax. In this case, it's like 2.3 plus minus 0.1 milli arc second. And, uh, we, this, this is converted into the accurate distance of 440 per sec. And in this plot also you notice that uh, there is a clear trend, uh, I mean, increasing uh, right ascension offset, which is of course proper motion. So by doing this kind of measurement, we can measure the very accurate distance of the source. And also we, we can measure the uh, motion of these stars. And of course we can do you know, similar thing for many other sources and also using many with other telescopes. So let me just introduce an example coming from EVN. This is a, a paper by, a paper published by uh, Kazi uh, 2012. It's a measurement, a parox measurement toward Cygnus complex. So it's a very complicated star forming regions with a multiple peak in uh, molecular line observations. And uh, actually uh, it reported um, parox measurement of several sources here and also here. And what is really interesting is 
uh, they detected kind of depth in these regions. So on the left, we have, uh, you know, most of these uh, star forming region have a distance around 1.5 kiloparsec. And this one is also 1.3 kiloparsec. But here's another source in the same direction, but uh, it's parallax distance is like a three kiloparsec. So basically they are totally separate object, you know, just, uh, you know, chance projection uh, observed in the uh, roughly same direction, but they are not associated. So this is kind of good example what we can learn uh, from uh, astrometric measurement. And of course we can, you know, continue this kind of thing for many, many sources. Uh, Bessel team are doing hard work using VLBA and also we are doing uh, monitoring with Fera. So let me briefly go through the history of astrometric measurement based on Bessel and Vera, uh, starting from a paper published more than 10 years ago. So this is uh, kind of pioneering work in this field, uh, paper published by Reed et al. 2009 which contains only 18 source. Uh, the number is not so big, but still it's very good. And actually it, it, has, it has, this paper has a very high citation profile. And uh, well, the number of sources is really small, but still it, it, they, they are really uh, good to trace like, uh, you know, average motion and also uh, acceleration due to galactic rotation. But anyway, this is the starting point 10 years ago. And then here is uh, my, our paper published in 2012 containing 52 sources. So we have uh, <clears throat> better accuracy in galactic rotation curve measurement, but still it's not, the number of the source is not really enough to trace the detailed structure of the galaxy like uh, spiral arms. And then 2014 read et al having more than hundred sources. And now we start seeing the structure of spiral arms and uh, you know uh, you know kind of complicated structure related to uh, galaxy uh, spiral and maybe bars so it's you know changing gradually and gradually and this one is uh read 2019 having more than you know uh, roughly 200 sources and uh, you can clearly trace uh, you know different arms and uh you know, spiral structure. So this is really good. And here is a new one uh, recently published at here at the 2020, also showing the very nice spiral arms. Uh, now we have uh, roughly 220 sources. So this is a kind of gain we made uh, for last 10 or a little more than 10 years. And uh, these measurements clearly suggest that uh, Milky Way galaxies uh, more or less like a forearm spiral galaxy. Well, I should say multiple, multiple spiral arm galaxies rather than grand design uh, having only two prominent spiral structures. So this, this is one clear finding from uh, astrometric measurement. And uh, I would like to show something similar about rotation curve starting from V2009. Uh, here is only one point. I mean, just the average of 18 source. So located at the, uh, you know, it's the kind of mean rotation velocity near the sun, you know, showing here. But uh, this is a 2012 result showing some, 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 you know, distribution along the galactic radius, but the coverage is still not really good. And then 2014, we have 100 sources starting from, you know, very close to galactic center up to 16 kiloparsec. And now we clearly see the trend. I mean, increase, increasing part uh, in the inner galaxy and also flat part, uh, which is well-known feature of rotation velocity in any galaxy, spiral galaxies. And here is a read 2019 uh, with 200 sources, uh, even better. And uh, also a recent paper by Hirota-san and uh, our team also showed a very clear trend in uh, rotation curve. So the major major finding about rotation curve is basically, you know, it, it's really flat, uh, especially in the outer galaxy, uh, starting from the position of Milky, uh, the sun itself, and then, you know, up to the last point, uh, 
uh, basically the structure is flat. And uh, of course, it, it, it is uh, you know strong evidence of existence of plenty of dark matter. It's just similar to extra galaxies. And uh, here is a summary of galactic constant. Uh, also, you know, again through the four papers for last ten years, and uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, you know, they are you know uh, the fundamental constant uh, when we consider the galactic structure. You know, our node is of course the center uh, distance to the center of the galaxy, and theta node is uh, mean. Uh, rotation velocity of the Milky Way at the position of the sun. So our node is converging around eight plus minus something, 0.1 or 0.15. Well, even between these two recent paper, uh, papers, like with 2019 and here to 2020, there is still a little difference. It's coming from, you know, how to treat outliers. You know, there are some some sources having a strange velocity and strange motion, and uh, also, you know, how to model the rotation curve. So maybe this difference is telling you about, uh, you know, estimate of kind of systematic error, but uh, basically they, they are kind of consistent. And also theta node is around 230. Maybe still systematic error has uh, an order of 10 kilometer, 10 kilometer per second, or maybe a little less than that. And uh, it's also very interesting to compare with other measurements of such as a star distance. So actually, of course, you are familiar with the stellar motion measurement orbiting around such as a star itself, uh, done by you know uh, Euro European group led by Reinhold Gensel and also a US group led by Andrea Getz. Of course, they, you know, you know that the, the, these guys won the Nobel Prize of Physics this year that, uh, for, for the wonderful uh, achievement. I mean, you know, providing uh, compelling evidence of a uh, supermassive black hole for such as a star. But anyway, th these stellar motions are also very much useful to measure the distance of such as a star itself. And their results are also, you know, something very similar to our measurement uh, between 9.7 and uh, to uh, 8.2 or something. And uh, I would like to note that these two measurements, I mean, VLB astrometry and gal galactic center stellar motion, they are totally independent. We are measuring the position of dynamical center of the Milky Way. Well, they are measuring the position of Sagittarius A star. So the consistency of, between these two measurements guarantee that uh, Sagittarius A star is really located at the dynamical center of Milky Way galaxy. So this is really, uh, well, it's a kind of natural expectation, but it's really good to confirm this, this uh, you know, that uh, Sagittarius A star is really located at the uh, dynamical center. So let me say a few few words about uh, comparison between Gaia and the VLB astrometry. Of course, if we talk about astrometry, everybody you know think about Gaia. Of course, Gaia is really a kind of super excellent project and producing many many uh, great results uh, based on optical astro astrometry. But uh, the main point I would like to stress is, you know, these two different uh, approaches kind of complementary, supplementary to each other. I, I, I mean, I even in Gaia era, we, we have something uh, where we can, you know, uh, where radio astrometry can do something really uh, nice work. Uh, for example, you know, this is the optical view taken with Gaia I mean, this is a real picture, you know, coming from Gaia data, uh, having e each uh, star's position and brightness. But of course, uh, along the galactic plane, there is a kind of dark area, which is obscured by molecular cloud and uh, galactic dust. So it it's really difficult to see through the these regions based on optical measurement. But in radio observations, of course, we are looking at, uh, for example, molecular clouds and uh, you know, mazes associated with stuff on regions. And the basically radio sky is a kind of transparent 
even within the galactic plane. So th these two figures show a very clear contrast uh, between these two astrometry uh, observations in different bands. So this is a quick comparison between Gaia and VLBI. Of course, Gaia produces so many results and uh, I cannot uh, introduce everything, but I just picked up a couple of examples coming from Gaia. But actually I'm showing the Gaia data release two <clears throat> result published at CATS 2018. Actually, it, it's a, a very nice analysis of six millions of FGK type stars. It's like a solar type stars. And the number is really huge containing six millions of sources. And the distribution is something like this. And here is the, you know, the square show the same region. So if you compare the region traced by Gaia and the VLBI, still we have a wider coverage, uh, like uh, you know, spiral arm <clears throat> in very far region and also you know, galactic central region. These are uh, regions uh, covered by only covered by uh, VLBI. And uh, if you take a look at the stellar distribution along the galactic plane, uh, it's also you know there is uh, some sort of uh, regions uh, where you know optical light is really obscured. So this is the plot of uh, these Gaia stars. But here, you know, the z-axis means a perpendicular uh, distance from the galactic plane. And this is, here is the sun, and this is the galactic center uh, direction. And so here is a kind of limitation where Gaia cannot see through the galactic disk because of dust obs obscuration. And so, uh, you know, this is kind of clear contrast, again, I, as I mentioned in, in the last slide. So again, you know, these results show that these two are quite complementary. And uh, here's a rotation curve plot. And uh, basically, these two are quite consistent. Uh, left one is coming from Gaia data release two, uh, showing flat rotation in the outer galaxy, while some, some uh, <clears throat> decrease toward the galactic center, which is also seen here. And th th this is uh, Gaia data release two coverage of rotation curve. So we, uh, VLBI is still a little wider coverage as I showed in the previous slide. Um, so this is uh, the most updated result from Gaia. So actually last week we had the new data release of Gaia, which is called early data release uh, three, so EDR three, and uh, it's still limited and uh, <clears throat> Of course, uh, maybe paper are coming from now on, from now on but uh, actually I just picked up one paper uh, just published in accordance with data release of, you know, uh, made last week. So the paper by Antoja 2020 cared about uh, still astrometry toward the anti-center region. I mean, L toward 180 degrees and uh, they picked up stars in the uh, square region, which is 10 degree by 10 degree. And they made, uh, you know, astrometric analysis and measuring distance and also rotation curve or something like that. So this is the plot shown in, in, in this paper, which is showing the rotation curve in the outer region, starting from, you know, here, here is the position of the sun. And uh, now they are tracing the rotation curve up to 18 kiloparsecs. So this is really nice. But actually these different color curves show uh, rotation curve coming from different types of stars. So blue ones and uh, orange ones are from young, young, younger population. And they are you know, kind of quite close to uh, the tracers observed with VLBI, that's the star forming regions. And uh, the longest, rotation curve is covered by red clump stars, which are old populations. And uh, you see clear trend that rotation curve is de decreasing here toward the uh, outer galactic regions. Well, of course, this is kind of natural expectation because uh, red clump stars have a large, larger velocity dispersion. So it's 
uh, supported, you know, more pressure supported rather than rotation supported. So basically, you know, it's a kind of natural expectation of the galactic dynamics. If you have a different population with different velocity dispersion, uh, they should tolerate different rotation curve. So here is a you know rotation curve coming from uh, gas and uh, you know uh, masers. So basically, you know you notice uh, there, there's a quite uh, clear you know uh, deviation between these two rotation curves traced by different population. So this is another good example showing that uh, tracing different population is really important to understand uh, the comprehensive view of galactic dynamics. And uh, so this slide shows uh, our current effort to extend our reach, I mean, you know, using VLBI. So, you know, so far we are limited to this area, like uh, say 10, plus, 10 kiloparsec from the Milky Way. But actually, there are some more major sources beyond that regions, and we are trying to measure this the distance and also motions of these sources. And actually, we are now located these three major sources uh, behind the galactic center. It's located beyond, say, ten kiloparsec away. But uh, of, of course, it's really difficult to measure the parallax toward these distant sources. So actually, what we did for these guys is to measure the uh, proper motion based on VLB astrometry and combine it with radial velocity measurement and uh, to use uh, rotation curve determined here to estimate kinematic distance toward these sources. So basically these are not direct measurement based on trigonometric parallax, but they are measured by kinematic distance. But still, kinematic distance provide quite accurate uh, estimate, like 10% error. And what is really most exciting here is that uh, there is a direct confirmation toward the most distance source based on parallax measurement. That is done by VLBA. Actually, it's a very exciting paper published by Sun et al. 2017. This, is, uh, this was uh, published in Science. And uh, this report uh, kind of record-breaking parallax measurement. It's report, it report parallax of 49 microsecond, which is, uh, which means a distance of 20 kiloparsec. So yeah, certainly this is the farthest distance uh, traced by the you know, means of trigonometric parallax measurement. So it, it's really excellent. So, of course, it's not easy to make uh, this kind of observation for many other sources, but uh, well, this is a nice example, show the potential uh, of what we can do with VLBI. And so hopefully, you know, if we have a better array, like, uh, you know, combined array of uh, global VLBI network, or maybe including SKA or energy VLA in the future, then probably uh, reach will be extended even beyond the galactic center. And also the, the, the other important thing is we need uh, southern hemisphere observations and that will be hopefully done with SKA and uh, also LBA and uh, maybe other new arrays. Uh, let me briefly introduce some other topics uh, a little beyond galactic structure. Uh, it's all still related to VLB astrometry, but uh, let me change the topic a little bit. Uh, but it's a kind of uh, byproduct of uh, maze astrometry. So, of course, uh, maze observation with VLBI are also very powerful to understand the nature of, uh, you know, stuff on regions. And I just picked up two examples uh, coming from our results. So this one is uh, a <clears throat> star forming region, uh, very famous star forming region, Orion KL, uh, observed with uh, VLBA and ALMA. So this is uh, Hirota-san's work published in 2014 and 17. Uh, this guy is uh, SIO Mesa uh, observed with VLBI showing the, the kind of disk outflow uh, 
And this is Alma uh, observation of thermal line. Uh, you know, it's associated with water, but it's thermal line and showing the very clear gradient in, in veloc radial velocity. So showing that this is a kind of disk. And Hirotsan also detected uh, rotating outflow. So this is a kind of comprehensive picture of this uh, particular object having the central edge on disk and the outflow system. And so this is provide a very nice view of, uh, you know, how uh, massive star forms and probably, you know, uh, forming through disk accretion like uh, solar type stars. And the, the other one is uh, recently published by Kim jong Hassan uh, this year, uh, toward G25 something, which also show uh, very strong water maser. And uh, we also measured the uh, parax and proper motions. But uh, actually this may water maser show a very wide uh, velocity spectra, you know, having, uh, you know, uh, high speed outflow traced by water mesa. So showing that uh, uh, outflow is kind of pull on, uh, you know, moving toward us and also moving away from us. And then what we expect is to see a kind of face on disk. And uh, Kim San did ALM observation and actually she successfully traced a kind of disk-like structure. And this is done with a methanol line uh, using our thermal line and showing a clear velocity gradient. And it's really useful to trace the mass uh, of the central object and showing th this case mass is something like 10, 10 solar mass, I guess. And uh, the, the, the other thing is associated with uh, time variability of MESA. So this is uh, one good example coming from M2O the collaborations. That's a MESA monitoring program uh, run by uh, many international contributions. Uh, uh, I think there are a lot of collaborators in Europe and also in Asia and the US and also in, <clears throat> in Australia and uh, South Africa. And uh, actually, this is uh, Barnes' 2009 paper in uh, 19 paper in Nature Astronomy showing the uh, methyl maser burst uh, traced. This is single disk spectrum, and uh, uh, this is LBA map, and uh, there is a very clear difference even with this with this short period. So these two epoch observations are separated only three weeks or four weeks, less than four weeks. And then, you know, the distribution of uh, methyl mesa is totally different, showing that there is a kind of a very uh, drastic uh, flaring event, maybe associated with uh, accretion burst or something and the changing the uh, mesa emitting uh, environment here around the central source. So this is another example uh, of, uh, you know, what we can do with mesas. Well, it's not uh, really uh, astrometry, but uh, it's related to VODA monitoring of MESA. And uh, also we can do something with AGB stars doing astrometry. Uh, so AGB stars, I mean, MIRA type variable, it's a long, uh, long period variable with a period of like one year or so. And uh, it show a kind of period luminosity relation, uh, brighter so have a longer period. And uh, this relation could be used as a kind of standard candle in astronomy. And this is Nakagawa-san's work measuring the accurate distance of a couple of Myra sources and the calibrate, uh, trying to calibrate the period luminosity relation toward these Myra variables. <clears throat> And again, I, I'm coming back to the direct comparison between Gaia and VOBI. Of course, for example, Myra, they are observable at both optical and radio. So we can do a direct comparison uh, of the parax. And of course, there are some other types of sources for which uh, we can obtain optical and uh, radio parax. So this is a result uh, published by Shu et al. 2019. 
showing the Vilvia parallax and the Gaia parallax, uh, which basically show a perfect match, especially for uh, nearby sources having a parallax of tens of milliarcseconds. But if you zoom up these regions, I mean, relatively distant sources, there is some sort of scatter. And uh, particularly for these red points coming from AGB, they have relatively large scatters. And this one is similar plot compiled by Nakazawa-san. Th this plot is, again, Vilvia parallax and uh, Gaia parallax, but only for AGB stars and uh, having larger dispersion here. So probably we have to understand what, what co really causes this. And I just would like to pick up uh, two extreme examples showing uh, totally different parallax val values uh, coming from Vera and Gaia. <clears throat> so the first one is SVPEG, uh, pub published by Sudo. I think it's not 2010, but maybe 2018 or something. Uh, this is parallax plot from Vera showing that Parallax is like three milliarcsecond, while Gaia says it's 1.1 milliarcsecond for its parallax. So it's totally inconsistent. And here is another example BX, BX CAM, uh, recently published by a student of University of Kagoshima. And again, you know, parallax uh, from Vera and Gaia are quite different. So maybe this is related to the photosphere structure of this uh, AGB stars because they have large uh, radius, as large as uh, one AU or something. And it could have a structure like a sunspot or something like that. But anyway, we, we still need to figure out what is the cause of such a discrepancy. Uh, maybe I have to uh, run in sh short of time, but uh, well, let me, say a few words that uh, Vilbia astrometry is not limited to masers, but uh, its application is quite really, uh, application is really wide. Uh, I mean, you know, covered many, many different topics like pulsars. There is a very nice project called Pulsar Pi measuring the uh, uh, pulsar parallax measurement and also pulse, pulsar motion measurement. Um, and also there is a very uh, exciting uh, astrometric observation of X-ray binaries like Cygnus X1 measuring the distance and also mass and also orbit of these binary stars. So th they are you know, a good example uh, of uh, VLB astrometry application beyond the masers. And also they are very powerful for uh, extra galactic object like uh, extragalactic water masers in triangular galaxies. And also this is very exciting result coming from EVN, uh, astrometry of repeating FRD uh, done by uh, Benito, which is very exciting. And also this is uh, measuring the you know, superluminal motion associated with gravitational wave event, which is a uh, neutron star, neutron star merger. Uh, so let me finish my talk with a few words about future. So, you know, I think this is our future. So we have, uh, you know, several powerful array, but uh, maybe we can combine these nice arrays to have to build a better uh, array, you know, uh, with better sensitivity and better resolution, better astrometry. That's really exciting. And hopefully SK, SK is coming and also maybe NGA, NGVLA is coming as well. And by combining with this uh, existing array, uh, we have uh, you know, uh, very bright futures. And of course, there are a lot, of, a lot, uh, lot more to do with maze astrometry, you know, having wider coverage of galactic structure and also comparison calibration of Gaia and, and so on, and better, understand, better understanding of star forming, star forming region as well as AGB stars. And the last uh, comment from me is something a little, something crazy, but uh, uh, VLB astrometry is also really very important for future SETI. Uh, you know, SETI will be a very exciting target for full SK era and once we detect something, 
like ETA signal, then we definitely need astrometry with VODI measuring the motion of this uh, ETI signal associated with orbital motion of exoplanets. So that, that will be another very exciting application of VOB astrometry. So thank you very much uh, for listening. And uh, our future, I believe our future is really bright and uh, you know, uh, that we really need global VOB observation. So let's make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Honma san We have a number of questions that have come in. Yeah. So I'll let you know what they are and um, we'll get some answers hopefully. Um, one of the questions is when variable masers are used to monitor source motions, how do you know that the source has not intrinsically changed between the observations? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, actually, you know, all the masers are variable and sometimes they are violently variable. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, you know, basically there are intrinsic change. I, I mean, the structure could be changed with time. And uh, uh, so actually, you know, we, we really need to a uh, careful analysis. So when you make a map of maser spot, you know, between the epochs, maser spot could be, you know, a little bit changed depending on epochs, but still we can try to, you know, we can find a kind of persistent maser spot, which has a, you know, lifetime longer than say, uh, uh, maybe a half year or maybe uh, longer than a year. So I think that's a very critical part of astrometric measurement. But uh, in most cases, if it comes to massive stuff on the regions, uh, there are, they are variable, but still we can find a kind of persistent structure. And uh, that's, uh, that's the reason why we can trace the uh, parallax and proper motions. So yeah, that, that, that question is really, really you know, uh, point, pointing a very uh, good point, but uh, you know, uh, of course, we, 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 we really care about that uh, structural change. Thank you. Um, another question that has come in is pointing out that the success of VLBI astrometry um, is highly dependent on the availability of um, calibrator sources that are appropriate um, or reference sources. Can you comment on the current status of calibrator availability? Um, in particular in the galactic plane and bulge regions and on plans for expanding the VLBI calibrator list, especially at frequencies above 15 gigahertz? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Yeah, actually, you know, it, it's really important to have a very nice calibrator, which is bright and of course brighter is better and also closer is better. But actually the number of calibrators, you know, currently you know, limited, like, uh, you know, it's coming from VLBA calibrator survey, having say uh, 4,000 sources scattered all over, you know, all over the sky. So basically we can find calibrator within say one or two degrees in most cases. But uh, if, you will, if you would like to have a closer reference, then you need uh, targeted search toward your own target, MESA, or maybe your own specific source. So it, require, it requires some additional work. And uh, yeah, so that makes uh, you know, astrometric observations a little difficult. Uh, you know, there is some sort of hurdle. And, but uh, hopefully, I believe you know, the situation is changing, uh, especially you know, having a new telescope like, uh, you know, uh, maybe you know SKA has a, SKA is going to have a very large field of view and a very high capability of survey speed, and uh, you know hopefully they will be very powerful to find a better calibrator. So well, at this moment, uh, you know we don't have a concrete plan to increase uh, good calibrators at uh, say frequency of 20 gigahertz or so. And uh, so at this moment, you need uh, your own special uh, 
extra observation to look for calibrators. But I hope situation will be changing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, what is the explanation for the phase offset between um, Gaia and Vera for SVPEG? Um, is it right that this is unexpected for a simple astrometric signal? And what would be the expected peak in astrometric signature? In other words, um, which one would be likely to be correct? Well, I, I am not sure what, what, what is uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, let me go back to the slide. Um, oh, just a moment, please. Uh, how can I go back? So the question is regarding this plot. And, uh, well, uh, so, so uh, maybe uh, uh, there's a little bit complication between these two diagrams. So, sorry, this is not, this is only from Vera and uh, this is right ascension plot and this is declination plot. So there is an exact 90 degree difference between these plots, but uh, it's not a phase offset between Vera and Gaia. Of course, it should never happen because we are observing from, you know, from, from the Earth or, you know, satellite near the Earth. So maybe uh, this will make some complications, but that's the explanation between, uh, explanation for the phase of it between these two curves. I hope uh, I answered that question. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, another one, um, does physics allow for very low frequency masers suitable for SKA low science? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I, actually, I have never considered about the uh, possibility of that. But uh, well, well, so far, of course, uh, there is uh, no masers, OH masers at 1.6 gigahertz. But uh, I'm not sure whether there is any expectation, even at low frequency, like less than one gigahertz. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Good question, a very interesting question. Okay, um, another one. Um, has the edge of a dark matter, matter distribution around a galaxy ever actually been observed? And do you have any thoughts about what kind of techniques could be used to try to do this? Because um, so far it seems like the rotation curves are, are mostly flat and it's as if the edge of the distribution hasn't been reached. Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, uh, our measurement is quite limited within the galactic disk because we need you know, star forming regions uh, in the galactic disk to be observed. Well, actually, Gaia is doing a better job. Of course, Gaia uh, can observe, uh, you know, halo stars, you know, which is very far away from the galactic plane and also galactocentric distance. And uh, as far as I know, there is a measurement of rotation velocity up to, uh, say, uh, 50 or 60 kiloparsec. It's not a kind of rotation curve, but uh, a measurement of you know uh, you know kind of motion of these uh, high velocity stars and uh, I, I think they are also very useful to trace the galactic potential and uh, basically the, the result is you know dark matter is extending up to say 50 or 60 kiloparsec even uh, up to the the reach of that uh, halo stars so I don't know, you know, how to how to touch <laughs> the edge of dark matter distributions, but uh, we, we need the deeper uh, uh, observations. With uh, maybe in, I, I think not radio, but uh, I think optical is more promising. Yes. Okay, thank you. And um, perhaps our last question: um, Can you comment on the future of Vera in the Ska era? Yes, of course, uh, Vera is, uh, you know, just a small alley. We have only four stations. And uh, so, you know, it, it's a kind of old fashion telescope. Now, you know, we, it's already 20 years old. And uh, the, the only possibility for us to uh, effectively, effectively utilize it 
is to make uh, international collaborations, you know, combining Vera and uh, also Asian partners and also European, you know, maybe US and Australian. Okay. So, you know, yeah, uh, we are happy to, you know, contribute such kind of, you know, global build effort. And uh, I think that's the right direction. So we prefer, uh, you know, observing in a global collaboration rather than doing a separate job using small array. Yeah, so that, that's our future. Okay, thank you very much indeed um, for a very interesting talk and interesting answers to all the questions. Thank you to everybody who attended and um, also to those who asked the questions. And um, we'll give a final thanks to our, our speaker and um, we hope that our next talk in this series will be perhaps sometime in the first half of February and we'll be letting you know when that is as soon as we can. Thanks very much to everyone. Thank you very much.